So we're blessed. It's not just any words that we're listening to this morning. It's the Holy Spirit inspired this text and uh, wants to speak to us today if we listen. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see the good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must return from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who's going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, help us by your Holy Spirit to really know and believe that you're present right here, um, that you're here to speak, that you're here to do a work inside of us that we can't do on our own, um, but that you call us to participate in. I guess wake us up, make our hearts alive to you, sensitive uh, to what your Holy Spirit would teach us this day. And we ask this because we know it's for our very best, it's for our good, but we also long that you would be glorified in our lives, that people would see you um, when they look at our lives. And so um, do this work, we pray again, a little bit more today in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so as we've looked at these um, different expressions of love, remember I keep kind of hammering on this, there's one fruit of the Spirit, which is love. Um, and Galatians 5, 22 and 23 talk about this, but then there's lots of expressions of that love. And this one feels to me like um, lots of them are difficult, obviously, when we look at our lives and say, I want that, but how does that happen? This one feels to many, many people impractical. Like given our world, given the context in which we live, how does gentleness make any impact at all? Like does it even work? to have gentleness, to try to exercise that and feel like it's effective. And I think part of that is because we have misunderstanding, so we're always trying to define these words that we use today, so let me try that again, just by starting with what I think it's not. Um, and a part of our struggle with gentleness is we think it's something that it's not. It's not um, weakness. So one of the key words that kind of, you say gentleness and a lot of people think, it means to be really meek kind of cowardly, kind of stuck in a corner, you're afraid. Um, that's kind of this gentle idea. That's not the gentleness that the Bible is talking about as a fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is doing this work in you to make you um, gentle. It's not a weakness. It's not being timidly. Um, it's also not um, passivity. It's not being really, really passive. So there's lots of ways, uh, there's all kinds of personality tests nowadays, there's a whole plethora of them, and they give you all kinds of letters and whatnot. Back in the day, there used to be two types, they used to, there was a type A personality, there was a type B personality, right? And they basically said, when you look at people, you really break it down in the broadest categories, there are some people that are aggressive, more aggressive, and people who are more passive. I see it on Donut Sunday, usually, back there, um, because you do, you see people, they get the donuts out there, and some people just, I mean, it's just like, look, I got a, a custard-filled promise from God, and I'm going to claim it right now, and, I, and they are just at the front of the line, and then others of you, they're just like, go ahead, that's fine, if there's any left, that's fine, but I don't really need, 
and that's just kind of built in personality wise, I guess, for various people. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about type A or type B personalities. Uh, what we are saying is that the Holy Spirit intends to work something that you see in Jesus. Because remember, the fruit of the Spirit means this is what God is like. We're not giving just kind of characteristics we pull out. We're saying this is how the Scriptures describe who God is. And God is gentle. And Jesus is the most gentle person, perfectly um, expressing gentleness who has ever lived. And God says, and I want that in you. I want you to live it, experience it, have it to be a part of who you really are in your very nature. Gentleness. Well, what's the, what is it then? If it's not these passive and kind of scared and timid, what is it? Here's the primary way I want to define it this morning. Gentleness is great strength under control. It's not a weakness. It's actually the greatest possible strength, but it's under control. One of the Greek words that's used for the word gentleness that's used in our text here actually gives a word picture for this. It's saying when you think of a wild animal, especially a large wild animal, say a wild horse, a wild stallion, that is trained, and in some measure we say they're tamed, it's not that they lose their power, it's just that all of that power in that animal has now been trained so that it's used for a good purpose instead of just randomly destructive purposes. And so the picture of gentleness is not that you somehow lose some power, but actually you have all the power, but it's trained, controlled by love. That's really the key here. Gentleness is great strength, controlled and measured and dispensed by love. And so that's the primary way we want to define uh, gentleness this morning. It's a directed power that becomes for the good of others and not for their harm. Jesus is gentle and humble in heart. So this passage from Matthew eleven twenty nine 29, it comes from a real famous passage where Jesus says, you remember this one? All those who are weary and heavy burdened, come to me and I will give you rest. We love that verse. Right after that, he says, because I'm gentle and humble of heart. And it's like, well, that's kind of an odd combo there, maybe a little bit. What Jesus is saying, I am gentle and humble in heart. He's not saying, because I used to be God, but when I became a human being, I kind of gave up my power. I promise you this, Jesus didn't lose any of his fastball in becoming human. He's fully God, fully man. He has all the power of God, and yet what's happening in Jesus' life in the flesh is that we see him begin to say, let me show you great power that's in control, that has a, a great measure of control to it. And you see this displayed in Jesus' life in lots of different ways. The devil actually tries to tempt Jesus right off the bat He's a human being, and as he begins his ministry, he goes into the desert wilderness, and he's tempted by the devil, and the devil keeps trying to tempt him. Gentleness isn't going to win the day, win the day Jesus. You don't need to be gentle. What you really need to do is use the power that you have. You're the Son of God. Turn these stones into bread. Go ahead and use your power. Jesus, you can throw yourself off the top of the temple and you can wow people. You want to win people over to you? Win them over with power that you exercise in these ways. You're not going to win them over with gentleness. That's really the temptations in the desert. And Jesus continually resists that temptation. He says, no, I am the Son of God, and I have all power, but I'm not going to use it as kind of this sideshow for people. I'm going to use it for the very best possible uses in the most gentle way that can be expressed. And so you see this throughout Jesus' life, and then when you get near the end, so next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And what does it say? Jesus enters, you remember how this all plays out, he enters riding a donkey, which is a significant way of saying, look, every other general at this time period in history, they have a great victory. How do they enter the town? They enter it with great pomp and circumstance. Great, I want to show these people how much power I really have. And they ride, ride these great stallions or they ride with um, a chariot that's pulled by three or four horses. And they come in this great way to kind of wow people. And here Jesus comes in gently, humbly. Here's your king. 
And he comes in a way that you don't expect. And that's kind of it. Here's the king of kings who actually has all power, but he's coming to us in such a gentle way. Now, some of you think about this and you're like, yeah, okay, but I have read my Bible, Cliff. Jesus, gentle. Let me give you some examples of when Jesus doesn't seem so gentle. Like maybe the time when he comes into the temple area and in the area where there's supposed to be prayer happening in the court of the Gentiles, all it is is money changers have all of their tables set up and they're doing commerce. And they basically kind of pushed out the whole purpose of that area of the temple for the nations to come and come near to God and to pray. And Jesus is ticked off. We know it because he comes into the temple and he actually physically, I thought about doing this as, a, as an illustration in our example here, like if I came down here, if I flip this table over, the whole dynamic of our room changes in a, in a minute here. As soon as I flip this table over, it's like, it's a very kind of jarring thing. And it's not, doesn't sound very gentle. Jesus flips over these tables and he starts hollering at this. This is supposed to be a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. And you're like, so if he's so gentle, how is he doing that? If Jesus is so gentle, how is it that when Peter messes up, the worst failure of all time, it feels like, because he specifically says, I'll never do this, I'll never deny you. And then just later that night, he's the one who's actually denying Jesus three times. How is it that at some point before then, he's like, I will never let you die. And Jesus rebukes him. He doesn't just rebuke him. He gives him the strongest Imagine if you came to church today and you're like, did God speak to you today? He did. He told me to get behind me, Satan. You know, I mean, that would kind of be like, wow, that's the word that you got. How is that gentle to say to Peter that right now Satan is using you, get behind me? And here's what I would say is that gentleness, again, is not this kind of monolithic. It's always going to look exactly the same. What I'm saying is that all of the fruit of the Spirit are always, always looking at the context in which they're expressed, and so they will always say, all together, that's why I say it's one fruit of the Spirit, you can't have gentleness without faithfulness. You can't have any of these fruits separated out and say, so this is what gentleness is always going to look like. But I will tell you this, when Jesus turns the tables over, it is the gentlest expression of love that he can give in that context for those people. You say, well, that's not very gentle, is it? It's more gentle than, and he could righteously do this, bringing them to death immediately in judgment, calling them out. He's the, he's the way, the truth, and the life. I take your life from you right now. Jesus could generally do that because he is holy God and we're sinners and he could say, I'm not going to just teach you this lesson by turning the, this table over. I'm going to actually bring judgment on you right now. And they would drop dead. Well, that seems a little more gentle now when you're like, well, what he's really trying to say is, this is the gentlest way I can do this, but I got to turn this table over because you will never hear me if I don't do this in your life right now. And that seems like a hard word, but it's the most gentle way possible. When Jesus tells Peter, Get behind me, Satan. That is the most gentle way that he can express his love to Peter and still get Peter's attention. By the way, notice he doesn't say, go away from me, Satan. He says, get behind me, Satan, which is exactly where, what, a disciple should be, following his master. He's basically saying, you've lost sight that you're the disciple, I'm the master, but I love you so much, but I know you won't hear this any other way. This is the gentlest that I can say this, get behind me, Satan. And so there's this expression of gentleness that is going to change depending on the context. And that works for me and you too. So if it changed for Jesus, he's like, in this case, this is the most gentle. In this case, this is the most gentle. That means for you and me, it's going to change too. The Apostle Paul kind of lived this out. Read his letters. There are some days where you're reading like, Paul is the most gentle guy ever. Galatians 6.1. If one of you is caught in a sin, yeah, what should we do now, Paul? Huh? Should we drop the hammer? If one of you is caught in a sin, restore that person gently. That's what he writes in Galatians 6.1. Now, there are other places you read the Apostle Paul, and it's like he just goes off. Like, he, he just loses it. It's like, 
listen, Corinthians, you're not battling sin. It's not that you're, you know, we all come in here every week and we're like, I messed up again this week. It's not like you're feeling bad about your sin, Corinthians. He writes to them. He says, what's actually happened is you've changed it so that you're sinning, but now to justify it, you're saying it's actually a good thing. And you're celebrating the very thing that you should actually be mourning and grieving in your sin. And so I'm telling you, he says, the most gentle thing that you could possibly do in a situation like that is actually... Stop associating with someone who calls themselves a brother or sister in Christ. The goal, of course, is to draw them back into fellowship. But he's saying in that context, that's the most gentle way. Do you you see how gentleness is not this one size fits all? It's every day. And you're like, well, then how in the world am I supposed to know how I'm supposed to express gentleness? And there is only one way, not just for gentleness, but everything. We have to walk by the Spirit. Like we have to, every day we're saying, well, Jesus, this is a brand new context. What, what do I do here? And if you're like, well, gosh, Cliff, I would have to like pray without ceasing if I was going to be doing that, right? I mean, I have to be praying all the time. Exactly. That's what it means to walk with Jesus is every day I'm like, well, this is a brand new context. God, help me to show, help me to know what true gentleness looks like here. So it's going to look different. We can't cause it. I keep saying that, but we can cultivate it. So there are things you you and I can do. Weed the weeds out of our hearts um, that are going to keep gentleness from really growing. Um, Throw some fertilizer in there that's going to help that, that growth of gentleness in us. The gentleness of the Spirit is by the Spirit, not by us. But I can cultivate it with these two things that Peter mentions. First is humility. Peter says these two things, verse 8, be compassionate and humble. Let me start with humility. Humility is not beating yourself down. Humility is saying, how does humility help me to grow in gentleness? It is getting me back aligned with a right view of who God is and a right view of who I am. And I just have to tell you, I lose that almost every day. Almost every day at some point in the day, I have missed sight of who God really is and who I am. Biblical humility is not beating yourself down. Oh, I'm no good. I can't do anything right. Blah, 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 blah. That's not biblical humility. Biblical humility is saying, I am not God, but I have spent most of this morning trying to pretend and live as if I depend on myself. And when I get sight of that again, oh God, thank you for showing me that and humbling myself before God and saying, God, I need you. I need you as much now as I've ever needed you. I don't stop needing you. At the core of all of our sin is that word pride, which is not just arrogance. Pride is this inability to stop and say, God is God and I am not. Pride actually flips it. Do you know that phrase where Jesus says in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know what pride says? No, it's my way. It's my truth. It's my life. And every day, there's this battle going on with pride and humility. Can I really see God for who he is and surrender to him? And the problem is, if I go the way of pride, which is, it's my way, my truth, hey, I got to live to make sure that I'm happy. It's about me finding my own happiness. I got to be true to myself. I mean, these are common phrases that people say. It's my life, and I got I to gotta find my way to be happy. That's what it's all about. Here's the problem with that. You and I will then never express gentleness in our relationships because there's really no way. Here's the reason why you and I can't express gentleness if we're not humble, and that's because there's only so many donuts in the world. There's only so many donuts. So whatever the donut is for you, it's like, if I could get that, I'll be happy. And so what happens is you see it, you want it, and there's two things that could happen. Either somebody makes a claim on your life, and now you're saying, I can't fulfill that claim and still get what I want, or someone is also competing for the very same thing that you want that you think is going to make you happy. And so what happens is without humility, pride automatically puts us in competition with one another. And what happens then, of course, is there is no way I can be gentle with you if my heart is empty and saying, I gotta have this donut. 
I got to have it. And right now, at that point, you begin to see why Peter says, you want gentleness in your life? You and I have to come back to square one, humility. God, you are God, and I am not. That's why Peter says, by the way, it's not just revere Christ. You notice in our text, he says, in your hearts, revere Christ, but it's revere Christ as Lord. It's not enough to say, I like Jesus. I really love Jesus. That's fantastic. I'm glad he died on the cross for our sins and all that. Fantastic. Guess what? The demons all believe that too. But here's the thing. Revering him as Lord says, you have to be the one who is my life, my truth, my way, not me. And coming back to that, we use the word surrender. We use the words dying to yourself. And and it's counterintuitive. It feels like, but if I don't go after that thing to make myself happy, I won't have life. And Jesus says, I know. That's why I'm telling you this paradox. Whoever seeks his life is going to lose it. But whoever loses his life, for me, Jesus says, revering me as Lord is going to gain it. That's where you find it, he says. So it's not beating yourself down, but finding your humility is found in a right view of who God is. I know... um, Back in the old days again, we used to have that, there used to be a bumper sticker, God is my co-pilot. Everybody ever have that bumper sticker, see that bumper? God is my co-pilot, which was kind of this idea that, hey, you know, I need God. And especially when I'm not always sure where I'm going, it's nice to have God in the passenger seat telling me where I might go, but otherwise I'm driving. And then, of course, Carrie Underwood comes along and she helps us to understand, no, Jesus has to take the wheel, right? And so she's saying, oh, that's right, Jesus, you take the wheel. And of course, if you've ever, you ever given up the wheel to somebody, I don't do that very well. I, I like to drive. I do not like to be in the passenger seat. So if you've ever been driving with somebody who you can tell, they really want to be driving because they can't help but basically try to drive for you even while you're in the driver's seat because they're going to, they even use that imaginary brake on the other side, you know, on the passenger side. And they're really, really worried all the time. You're going to miss the next turn. You better slow down here. Did you see this car on the other side? And it's like, man, who's really driving here? So even when we say, Jesus, take the wheel, at some point, humility says, am I really letting him drive here? You know what we really need is not just Jesus, take the wheel, Jesus, take the keys, take the title. Yes, take the insurance, take the tags, take it all because I do not want to have this flip-flop life. Jesus is Lord, but I got to take care of this one myself. And Peter says, I know this sounds like an odd stretch to gentleness, but you and I can never be gentle with one another until we get that right. Until humility puts us in a place where we say, Ah, now I'm free. Humility actually brings freedom. Do you ever see a kid in the back seat? Not not when they're fighting, but I mean kids in the back seat when you're doing the driving. The driver has to worry about everything. I don't want to miss this turn off. I gotta make I gotta make sure there's enough gas in the car. I gotta do it. The driver's focused on driving, making sure everything. A kid in the back who knows it's not my responsibility is free. I don't worry about anything. I don't even know where we're going. They just plop me in the car, and here I am. I guess I'll find out when we get there. There's this total freedom when I actually give it back over to God and say, yeah, God, you may take me places that I had no clue I was going, but I'm going to live free. And only in that freedom can I love my neighbor as I love myself. There's a reason there's an ordering When Jesus says, they ask Jesus, what's the most important thing? He says, let me give it to you in this order. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. If that's in place, now you can love your neighbor as yourself. Not until then. And we lose it. I used to say, I surrendered to Jesus when I was 14 years old. Great. What about today? Resurrender. Dying to myself all over again. Yes, Jesus, because I take it back. But when that's in place, 
Gentleness can grow. I can't create that growth, but I can cultivate it by saying, I'm going to continually focus on making sure I've got humility between me and God. And now, God, your gentleness begins to grow inside of me. And it grows along with compassion. You can cultivate compassion. He says, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. And this is going to lead us to uh, have gentleness grow as well. So this humility with God begins to turn my eyes. See, the, and that's the way it works, isn't it? Like if I really am free in the back seat, God's doing all the driving, he's Lord. I don't have to be consumed with, but what am I going to do about here? What, what about this? What about, I'm actually freed up to not be so self-centered in my thinking, anxious and angry. And now I'm freed from that and I can say, okay, what about you? What about my brothers and sisters? And Peter says, so be compassionate. How do you command compassion in somebody? He says, well, here's a couple things. Be like-minded. How am I going to be like-minded with you? Unless at some point I listen and have some idea of what's in your mind. There's no way to be like-minded by just saying, hey, I know what I think. If you guys want to come along, I guess we can be like-minded. It's like, no, I have to listen. And at some point you realize, yeah, but then we disagree. Cliff, I tried this one time and we just disagree when I open up and I say, well, what do you really think? And how do you really think? And Peter is saying, yeah, like-mindedness is not that you have uniformity in all of your thoughts and ideas. It is saying, as you open yourself up to another person and you listen for them and you discover that they're different here and you're different there, well, what do we have in common that's greater? Not just what we have in common. What do we have in common that's greater? And for the Christian, it's always Jesus. You missed us at the first service. We had a couple from Cuba I mean the country, Cuba, who was here at the first service. They don't speak English. I don't speak Spanish. I took a little German. I tried that. That didn't work real well. That wasn't helpful. But they came, and I promise you, and there's this great app, you know, you speak into it, and then it translates for both sides of you. We're talking this morning. All I can tell you is that they are brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's all we need to know. All we need to know at that point. We're like, Jesus? Yes. See, boom, there's this instant connection. Do you realize that's what Peter's saying? You're going to have these differences. Don't ever forget what matters most that brings you together. And it's always, always, always Jesus. Be like-minded. Be sympathetic, which is this empathy. I not only hear what's happening in your life, but it goes from my ears to my head and somehow gets to my heart. So empathy is your pain in my heart is one way to think about it. I have to open up. I can't possibly do that if I'm anxious and angry about what I need for myself. But if I'm humble before God and I say, God's got me covered. I don't know how. I have a need, but God's got that covered. I'm going to trust him for that. Now I have an openness to now have your pain come and I can help you bear it and you can bear mine. And the only way that happens is the people who are freed up from self-focused concern. Peter says, so when you got that, that humility is working, go ahead and open up your heart and start to actually carry each other's pain. And it means, yeah, kind of understanding. I know there's a certain empathy you have when you have the same experience. How many of you had your gallbladder out? Most of Beloit has had their gallbladder out. But when you go through something like that and you say, oh, I had to have my gallbladder out. If somebody says, oh, I've never had that. I don't know what that's like. Is that real bad? Is that a big deal? Well, I'll try to tell you. But if somebody says, oh, I had my gallbladder out, there's kind of this instant connection, isn't there? You know, people who've had kidney stones. Oh, yeah. Oh, I know what that's like. And suddenly there's this kind of connection. You're empathetic. The pain that they have, you already understand in your heart. And so there's this now, if you're not already in humility with God, you know what this turns into. It becomes the competition. Oh, oh gosh, I had this, I had this uh, bulging disc and I, they, had to, they had to work on something on my back. And somebody goes, well, I had two. I had two bulging discs. 
And I had my appendix out at the same time as they were working on that, and they ran out of anesthesia, and I didn't have any of that. And, you know, and it's always sort of this one-upsmanship, and it's like, well, he kind of empathizes, but not really. It becomes this, no, my pain is greater than yours. And Peter's saying, no, sympathy, this true, loving sympathy is saying, no, let me just hear your pain and help carry it, because what's happening to you matters to me. That is where gentleness begins to grow, he says. Gentleness is this sign of trust that God is at work in us in such a way that bringing us together, settled in Him, I have this new way of opening up to you and you to me. And He says, this is where gentleness really begins to grow. The, the reason that we struggle so much is in our relationships. We think, oh yeah, I'm, I'm good with God. And then we go out and we try to fix people. We're not very gentle with each other. Hey, that's wrong. You got to fix that. That's, that's not biblical. You're bordering on heresy there. You got a real problem here, and, and we want to fix people. And we say it's for their, no, I care about them. I don't want to see them go down this path. Yeah, I get that. But at some point, Peter's saying, you know what? There needs to be a gentleness that happens so that even when you have to correct, you're always doing what Jesus is saying. He's saying, what's the most gentle way? I can express this love to a brother or sister. And when I'm not able to then reach my point, because this happens a lot, some of you, and, and I do too, have family members who are not in Christ. It grieves my heart. But the worst thing that we can possibly do is say, I'm going to save them. Oh, I'm going to tell them. I, I just know if I could just, I tried to tell to them last time, I didn't have the right words. I'm going to get the right words this time. I'm going to say them more forcefully this time. I'm going to, and man, we start hammering and hammering. And what we're really saying is, I do not trust God to love this person as much as I do. I must love them more than God because God doesn't seem to be doing much with them. And then we start to press. And there's a really fine line between letting the Holy Spirit use you and trying to use the Holy Spirit or be the Holy Spirit for somebody else. And gentleness is the cure for that. Gentleness is saying, look, if God gives me an opportunity to speak, then I will, but I don't have to press anything here because I've got a God that I trust in who's at work. And there's this great beauty. There's a beauty to gentleness which shows power under control. And you reveal it again in Jesus. I think of Jesus with, remember the woman called an adultery? And this radical mob drags this woman caught in adultery before Jesus, and they begin to say, and they prod him, look, the law says that she should be stoned to death. That's what the law says, that God gave us. God gave us the law. That's what it says. Jesus, what do you say? And Jesus, to me, this would be an opportunity for Jesus to just launch out and rant about you guys are self-righteous. You know, you're all going to hell. This is, you are twisting God's word. Instead, Jesus is just drawn in the dirt, and they keep prodding him. And finally, Jesus says, and I hear it in this most gentle, which is not weak, gentle but strong way. Well, whoever is without sin, go ahead and cast the first stone. Oh, if you don't think gentleness has an impact in our world, listen to Jesus. Because in that moment, without saying anything else, Man, there is conviction. And the oldest ones first drop their stones. And the younger ones start to be like, man, there might be some wisdom here that I'm missing. And finally, they all leave, and it's just Jesus and the woman, and Jesus turns to her then. And he's like, well, what's he going to say now to this adulteress? And he, he's like, so do you have any more accusers? Anybody who's condemning you? And she goes, no, I guess they all left. And then gent, gently, gentleness is both grace and truth, he says, so then go and sin no more. Leave your life of sin. And so what he's saying is, man, you are loved. Yes, you've got to be corrected here, but you are so loved. And the gentleness of Jesus is powerful and beautiful in that moment. I think of Jesus after the resurrection. He rises from the dead. He goes and he seeks out Peter, who really blew it. And there's this huge elephant in the room. Like, you know, okay, 
We're going to have a little breakfast here by the Sea of Galilee. It's good to see you guys again. Glad everybody could make it. And, um, you know, just thought uh, we could have a little time together. And everybody knows exactly. I mean, Peter is there, but he knows this huge elephant in the room. Well, how are we going to deal with this failure of mine? And Jesus does it in the most gentle, powerful, loving way as, as possible. Instead of saying, well, Peter, let's go back to where you really blew it, because look at this verse here. You, you clearly were wrong. You thought you'd never mess up, and then you were so proud about this. You compared yourself to the other disciples. He doesn't do any of that. He doesn't launch into a teaching. He doesn't give a seminar. He says, Peter, come here. I just want to ask you, do you love me? Oh, well, yeah, you, you know I do. Okay, I got another question for you. Do you love me? But you know I do third time. Peter, do you love me? And in the most gentle way possible, even though it breaks Peter's heart in two, oh, you're cutting me to the very core, but you're doing it in the most gentle way. I'm not asking you, Peter, do you love me? I, I, or I'm not asking that, do I love you anymore? I'm telling you, I love you. The only question is, do you, do you love me? Because I've got great things in store for you. I know you blew it terribly, but I got great things. It's a powerful gentleness because Peter's not the same after that. He is not the same after receiving that kind of gentleness. And lastly with this, so this Monday Thursday, uh, which is a week from Thursday, those of you who've been to our Monday Thursday service, it, it, we kind of had, we've done the same format for a, a little while. This is going to be different this year. And so one of the things I felt like God wants us to focus on was we're going to pray through, they call it the seven last words of Christ. It's not just seven words, but it means... In the Gospels, when you see after Jesus is actually nailed to the cross, that he utters seven distinct phrases or, or sayings while he's hanging on the cross dying. And we call them the seven last words of Jesus. And so I've been meditating on that because we're going to pray through that on Monday, Thursday. We're actually going to sing our prayers uh, on Monday, Thursday. I hope you can make it if you can. But I was meditating on this because I was thinking the first word that Jesus says on the cross after he's been nailed to the cross says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And somewhere from that point to the next word that Jesus says, a miracle happens. Because the Gospels tell us that Jesus is crucified with a criminal on his right and on his left. And that these criminals, at the beginning, the Gospel tells us that they both mocked Jesus. They both did. Neither one of them had faith in Christ when they were both crucified at the same time as Jesus. But something happens to the one criminal, and all he can do is hear what Jesus is saying, but he hears Jesus say in a moment where he would expect Jesus to lash out because people are spitting on Jesus and cursing Jesus and mocking Jesus, and he would expect, because he and the other criminal are certainly doing this too, to lash out. Finally, it's easy to say that you love people. Wait till they drive nails through your hands and through your feet. Wait till they spit on you and mock you and put you up for, in display. I want to hear what this guy says now. Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. And that word, a gentle word, not an angry word, not a vindictive word, not a word of, boy, wait till I rise again and I'll show you guys. No, it's, Father, forgive him, changes the heart of this criminal. And in a moment, he sees the truth. God opens his heart and he says, wait, I know kings have all kinds of power, but I just realized I'm next to, right next to, on my cross and his cross, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so he says to Jesus, Jesus, I've missed this, but now I see it because of your words. In gentleness, powerful gentleness, Father, forgive them. That would include me, Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus, his second word, oh, I tell you, truly I tell you, today you're going to be with me in paradise. There's this beautiful transition from death to life for a man who's about to die, all because of a powerful and beautiful word spoken by Jesus that is in the greatest gentleness possible. A God who doesn't lash back out at us when we mess up, 
When we've sinned and rejected him, a God who doesn't lash out but says, I love you, come to me, come to me. And he says, I will not reject you. Peter wrote his letter to Christians living in a culture that opposed them. The world has seen enough angry, ranting Christians. It has seen enough. It doesn't affect them because they say, well, they're just playing by the same rules that we do. What the world needs to hear is powerful, gentle words of grace and truth that say, no, there's a Savior and the same gentleness that he spoke in his life that was powerful and changed lives. He's working that in us and he will work it in anyone, anyone who surrenders to him. And we call people to that. Peter says, you're going to You're going to share the gospel. You're going to do evangelism. You're going to give the reason for the hope that you have. But the primary goal of evangelism, the way that you do it, he says, matters. Do it with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect win the people's heart in a way that you can't do it by trying to force it, he says. This is a people that reflects the beauty and the power of Jesus. Let's pray.